John Calipari is one of the greatest college basketball coaches of all time. Wherever he goes, they tend to win. But wherever he goes, they also tend to have a lot of problems. Whatever school he was currently coaching at, the fan base and the players absolutely loved him. And if you weren't a player and you weren't a fan of that college, you hated this guy. It goes without a single doubt in my mind that John Calipari is single-handedly the most hated coach in college basketball history. Maybe people hate him because when he was at UMass, one of his star players was caught receiving money. Or maybe it's because he was caught making racial comments to an NBA reporter. Maybe it's because Derrick Rose at Memphis was caught not taking his SAT in high school and was still allowed to play. Or maybe it's because there was a bizarre scandal that went on at Kentucky, which is the current school he's still coaching at. You may hate John Calipari, or you may love him, but there's one thing we can all agree on. He's the sketchiest coach in college basketball history. What's good y'all, I hope you're having a blessed day. This is a new series I'm gonna be bringing to the channel and I'm extremely excited. We're sort of in the off season and there's not too much content to be made, so I was thinking, who doesn't love a great mystery and we should go over some of the biggest scandals in college basketball history. I hope you guys are excited about this series as I am, so if y'all wanna see a part two, as soon as this video gets a thousand likes, I'll drop it. Or not a part two, but episode two. You get what I'm trying to say. We're gonna call this new series The Matt Be Great Mystery Cases, and this is episode one. So get you a snack, get you some popcorn, you're in for a treat. In this video, we will be taking a deep and detailed look at some of the weirdest and fishiest things that one of the sketchiest coaches has ever done. So without further ado, let's get into the video. What do you think about when you hear the name John Calipari? For me, there's a lot of things that go through my mind. To get into this case, we're not just gonna look at the main points. We're gonna touch on every single detail that I think is very important to this case. John Vincent Calipari was born on February 10th in 1959. He was born in Moon Township, Pennsylvania, and that is relatively close to Pittsburgh. While he was growing up, his father did work in a steel mill plant, and then he also worked at an airport. His mom also had a pretty basic job. She worked in a school cafeteria, and she served ice cream. Growing up and throughout his high school basketball career, I'd say he was an above average basketball player, but he wasn't great. He wasn't genetically gifted, he wasn't 7 foot, and he couldn't jump out of the gym, but he was a good shooter. He was good enough to sign I went UNC Wellington, which was a small college at the time, and things didn't go so good. At this college, he only played there for one year, which was the season 1978 through 79, and in 25 games, he only averaged 1.2 points per game. He didn't play that much, and it was just a bad season overall. He averaged under one assist, one rebound, and shot 23.5% from the overall field. I guess you could say things weren't really a great fit for him, and if you are wondering, he played point guard and he was listed at six foot. He would eventually transfer and make his way over to Clarion University, which is in Pennsylvania. This is where he graduated with a bachelor's degree in marketing and he played point guard there for the 1981 and 1982 seasons. Things were much better at this college. He led the team in assist and free throw percentage. He wasn't known as a high level scorer, he was known as a true point guard. You gotta remember at this point in time, point guards, they were just known for passing, they weren't really scoring. So for his playing career, he was what I would like to label as a very solid player. He wasn't going to win you a game, but he wasn't going to lose you the game either. It was also around the same time that he knew what he wanted to do the rest of his life, and that was to be a college coach. He loved the game and every aspect of it, and he wasted zero time. As soon as he graduated from Clarion College, he got a coaching job that same season in 1982. Or not that same season, but after that season in the same year. And from the year 1982 to 1985, Calipari was an assistant at the University of Kansas, so hey, that's not a bad starting job. I know what some of you might be thinking because I was thinking the same thing. How did he already become an assistant at Kansas in such a short amount of time and he's so young? Well, it wasn't as great as it sounds. He was at the bottom of the barrel in this system and they didn't treat him so hot. From 1982 to 83, he was labeled as a volunteer assistant, so he did all the dirty work. If the coach wanted a water, he would make Calipari get him a water, stuff like that. Even though he was at the bottom of the pyramid, I still think he was the ultimate winner because he started out at Kansas and here's what he had to say about it. Quote unquote, I was blessed to have the chance. 
Can you imagine being 22 or 23 and your first opportunity to be around the game is at a program like Kansas? After his three year period at Kansas, he would then take another three year period and be an assistant coach at the University of Pittsburgh. There's not too much to say about his career at Pittsburgh because he wasn't the main guy just yet, but that would quickly change. Following that 1988 season, he would then be named the head coach at the University of Massachusetts, also known as UMass. And now this is where our story starts to heat up and get really interesting. Let me give you a perspective as to where we're at in this story. Before he got to UMass and before he was named the head coach, he was known as this quiet and humble kid that did everything by the book. He wasn't a nerd, but he wasn't a troublemaker, and he wasn't going to break the rules by any means. Sort of ironic considering what we're about to get into, so let's just get into it. Calipari's first year and season at UMass was very typical of a first year head coach. It takes a while to implicate your system, normally two to three years before you get the guys you want in there and you can start performing at how you would expect. For his first year, which was the season 1988 through 89, he finished with a 10 and 18 record. He was a first year coach, so not too big of a deal. But in the following season, this is where he had a record of 17 and 14, and everybody started to pay attention. 17 and 14, not that great of a record, and really not even that good, but people saw what was about to happen. It's not really the fact that they were three games over 500, but it was the fact that they went from 10 and 18 to 17 and 14. That's a big difference. You could tell and feel like they were slowly but steadily getting better. And then in 1990 through 91, which was his third year, they finished with a 20 and 13 record. You can kind of feel and see the pattern and see what people were thinking back then. You got this new and young head coach who took a losing team and a losing program and now in just three years, they're known as a winning team. At the same time, you did have people that were skeptical about this and saying they just had a couple good seasons and it was a fluke. However, after his fourth year, it was no longer a fluke and people started to pay attention to UMass of all schools. In just his fourth year there, 1991 through 92, he put up a marvelous record of 30 and five. They then proceeded that with a 24 and 7 record the next year, then a 28 and 7 record and a 29 and 5 record. I'm a big guy on giving credit where credit is due, and John Calipari, you can say what you want about him, but he's a winner. He took a team that nobody thought in a million years could compete in basketball, and they were a powerhouse. As good as those seasons were, they were all missing one key aspect, no national championship and no Final Four. From 1991 through 95, they were the regular season champs of their division and also the conference tournament champions and made the NCAA tournament every single season. The first couple of years, the fan base was happy with it, but at a certain point, you start to want more, and that's just human nature. And in 1995 through 96, this is where everything would come together and click, but it would also blow up. UMass and John Calipari was running through the competition. Nobody could stop these guys. They weren't just beating teams, they were demolishing teams and everybody in their way. They finished the regular season with a 31-1 record, was the regular season champs and won their conference tournament, and of course got to the NCAA tournament. They would eventually make it all the way to the Final Four, and this is where they would lose, but it was still a great season. One thing that we need to note about this 1995-96 through team is that they had an outstanding player that would be the number two pick in the NBA draft, Marcus Canby. Technically, on the books, that team finished 31-1 because the NCAA vacated their tournament record, which was 4-1. The reason the NCAA vacated their wins because it was discovered and announced that Marcus Canby received money from a sports agent. Of course, when something like this happens, everybody looks at the head coach, and all eyes are on Calipari. Immediately, what everybody thought is, oh, this is why Calipari's winning these games and getting these good players, because he's paying them. But according to John himself, Himself, he implicated and said and denied any actions of any wrongdoing. One key piece and note and factor to add to this that I thought was unreal is that a couple of years prior in 1994, this came out. What I'm about to tell you happened in 1994, so this was before it was discovered that Marcus Canby was receiving money. People around the program and just in general were saying that Marcus was struggling with grades. John Calipari went on to say that he was struggling with his grades, but he turned it all around 
and he made the quote-unquote athletic director's academic dean's list. So hey, that sounds good. He made the athletic director's academic dean's list. But there's one problem with that statement. That list doesn't even exist. It's made up. That's not a real list. John Calipari made that up. If that doesn't scream sketchy, I don't know what is. And remember, that happened in 1994, so that was two years before the allegations of Marcus Camby receiving money came out. And oh yeah, to top it all off, Camby, in matter of fact, was on academic probation. So John Calipari lied because he did not turn his grades around. He just flat out lied about that. And if you thought it couldn't get even stranger, this is where it really starts to get fishy. Remember, Calipari said he had no idea that Marcus Camby was receiving money. And there was no real way to prove that John Calipari knew about this, so it was his word against everybody else's. With all this optimism in the air, it had everybody questioning John Calipari's legacy, but to make matters even worse, as soon as these allegations were going on, he left UMass right after the Final Four was vacated. I mean, it's a little strange that he left when all this was going on. You can say it's a coincidence or whatever, but you can't lie, it's strange. He would later make a statement in an interview about all this going on, and here's what he had to say. No, we didn't know anything. What we did was everything ahead of schedule. We were on top of everything we did, and again, they say we didn't know or know or should have known. We were the ones that got Marcus Camby to talk to the NCAA. He was in the NBA, he didn't need to talk to the NCAA. There were other players at other schools involved that wouldn't talk, and we got our guy to talk to the NCAA and paid the money back. That is something that a lot of people that don't like Calipari won't throw in there in the story, is that Marcus Canby did pay the money back, but he was already in the NBA, so it was like pennies to him. If you thought his career was already crazy, just wait, because we're just getting started. When he left UMass, he would then go to the New Jersey Nets, and he was the coach there for three years. His brief stint in the NBA, it was one that he would like to forget. He wound up finishing 72 and 112 in three years. And then ultimately, he was fired only 20 games into the 1998 through 99 season. Him getting fired from that NBA job was a blessing in disguise, because I feel like he liked college way more. There wasn't a huge scandal like in college that happened in the NBA for him, but one thing that got everybody mad and to hate him even more is what happened here. In 1997, he got mad at a local quote-unquote columnist and he yelled at her quote-unquote Mexican idiot. And the person he told that to was Mexican, so it was a racial slur at the time and a lot of people were giving him backlash for it. If that would have happened today, he would be, I don't know, he might get fired for something like that. But back then, it was a big deal, but not like today. He did go on to later apologize, but it did ruffle some feathers while he was in the NBA. After coaching the Nets, he was an assistant coach for one year with the Sixers, but in 2000, this is when he made his legendary return. When it was announced he was coming to Memphis to return to college basketball, that fan base acted like they won the lottery. They had every right to feel that way because they knew he was going to turn this program around because look at what he did at UMass. I understand he didn't have a great career in the NBA, but there's something about great college coaches. They don't always thrive in the NBA, but if they're good in college, they're always going to be good. His career at Memphis started in 2000 and it ended in 2009 and it was very similar to what happened at UMass. It's almost crazy to say this, but his first year was his rebuild year and he went 21 and 15, so he was already on a winning note. He then proceeded to follow that up with a 27 and 9 record, a 23 and 7 record, and a 22 and 8 record. But in 2004 through 5, this is where the fan base started to get a little irritated. In this season, this is where they went 22 and 16, and if you notice, in the previous three years, they had better seasons, so it's almost like they was taking a back step. Or not a back step, but a step back. I think that makes more sense. But yeah, anyways, the fan base was somewhat mad by this because at the time at UMass, he was already winning 35 to 30 games. I know what some of you may be thinking. Yo, Matt, UMass and Memphis, they're playing in different divisions and different competition. But still, people at Memphis, they were wanting to win and win fast. One thing I will say about Calipari is that when he's under pressure, he always performs best. 
I guess you could go out on a limb here and say he hurt the haters and critics and in the next year 2005 through 6 he finished 34 and 4. Then to top that off in 2006 through 7 they once again finished 33 and 4. Those were great seasons they were getting to the NCAA tournament but they weren't winning it and they wanted to win a championship. In the next season this is where they went 38 and 2 and got to the final four but Unfortunately, they didn't win the championship. And then in his last and final year, they went 33-4 and once again, but failed to win a national championship. I want to take nothing away from this, but John Calipari not winning a national championship at Memphis, a lot of people were disappointed because he was there for roughly nine seasons. He finished better than 33-4 and in four straight seasons, but here's the problem with that. People got used to him winning that many games. They wanted him to win a championship, but he could never get that monkey off his back. And to make things even worse, you couldn't say he wasn't getting top tier talent because they did have Derrick Rose. Regardless, doing what he did, it was still amazing because he turned a losing program once again into a winning program. But, 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 it didn't come without a price and there was a scandal going on. Like I said earlier in this video, wherever he goes, he wins, but there's also a lot of problems. At this point in time, people knew if you're going to get John Calipari, it's a high risk and high reward. You're going to win games, but there's going to be a lot of stuff, negative things, that comes with it. As good as Derrick Rose was for Memphis, and he was amazing, take nothing away from his performance, but he shouldn't have even gotten to the school. It was announced that Derrick Rose gained admission into Memphis with a fraudulent SAT score, which means somebody took the test for him. At UMass, when those allegations came out for Marcus Canby, people didn't immediately pin it on John Calipari, but they thought maybe he could have something to do with it, but some people were giving him the benefit of the doubt. But now you can see why people start to pin the blame on him even more because this is now the second time it's happened at a different school. Look, I'm gonna make this short and sweet. We can sit up here and debate all day long if this was John Calipari's fault or not, but here's the reality. Whether you think it was 100% his fault and his idea and he was the mastermind behind his plan, we can all agree that John Calipari at least had a little info and knowledge about the situation. He was either slightly involved in it or he was totally involved in it, but he was at least aware of what was going on with Derrick Rose. And to top that off, and to make things even worse, Memphis was also charged by the NCAA by giving Derrick Rose's brother free travel and money on their road trips. It was said in total that they only gave Derrick Rose's brother $2,000 worth of travel and accommodations, but you know how the NCAA is. They don't want any of these guys getting a dime. And ironically, after all this came out, John Calipari would transfer, or not transfer, he's not a player, but he would leave Memphis like he did UMass. Even though he left on a bad note, Memphis fans were devastated about him leaving because if you were a part of his sensation and his winning process, you loved him. The only people that didn't like John Calipari is the people that weren't a part of the process and weren't a part of his college team. And as successful as he was at UMass and Memphis, the sad part about it is that even to this day, they vacated their Final Four appearances. So technically, it's like they didn't happen, but deep down, we know it happened. And Kyler Perry himself will even still go on to say he doesn't care what anybody says, he didn't do anything wrong. When he would leave Memphis the year after, in 2009 through 2010, this is when he would join Kentucky and where he's still currently at. This situation was a little different for Kyler Perry and I think we know how most of this goes. He didn't have to come in and build a winning program from a losing program because Kentucky was known as a pretty decent school. And in just his first year there, they went 35-3, and three, so he was known as a winner from the start. I'm not going to bore you and talk about every single season with Kentucky basketball because we know somewhat of what's happened, but we gotta talk about, yet again, another scandal that happened when he first got there. So unlike his previous two schools he was at, this scandal happened when he right at first got there. The other ones happened at the end. It was actually so bizarre that this scandal almost cost Kentucky their entire 2009 through 2010 season. It was revolved around one single player and he went by the name of Eric Bledsoe. Apparently, it was said that Eric Bledsoe had a C in an Algebra 3 class in high school, but they changed it to an A. Why is changing his grade from a C to an A a big deal? Well, it just so happened that this bumped his GPA up to the NCAA eligibility 3. 
threshold, which means he could play. If not, he couldn't. Of course, Bledsoe denied any wrongdoing and Calipari denied it too. Not only did Calipari deny it, but they couldn't prove he had any involvement, so they didn't convict him. And as crazy as this situation sounds, the NCAA said this, and I can't even believe it. The high school he went to in the NCAA ultimately couldn't prove anything, so they said this. Quote unquote, we think you're lying, but we can't prove it. You're free to go. That's got to be the most frustrating thing for the NCAA. They think he's lying and they know he is, but they can't prove it. So you can't put these allegations on Calipari and Bledsoe. So to make that long story short, they somehow, John Calipari in Kentucky, got away with it and he hasn't been involved in anything like that since. But to make things even more controversial shortly after, when asked in an interview, I don't know if he thought people weren't going to pay attention, but he said this about illegal NCAA violations. Quote unquote, most coaches have an idea of what's going on. We're all going to have our own opinions, and I'm very curious. Drop your comments and opinions on all of this down below. For me, do I think Calipari had any involvement of any of these three scandals at every school he's been at? Yes. I don't think it's a coincidence that at every single college he's been at, there's been something similar that's went on. And to say he has no involvement whatsoever, that's just complete BS. It's kind of strange that at Memphis, he got Derrick Rose to change his grade, and at Kentucky, they did the same thing with Eric Bledsoe. At UMass though, that situation was different. It was said that Marcus Canby had an agent giving him money, so maybe Kyler Perry, that wasn't his fault, but I'm sure he knew it was going on. Whether he was the mastermind behind all of these scandals, that's up for debate, but I know that he was involved somewhat. He may not be the most controversial coach of all time because that's probably Bob Knight, but he's gotta be up there. And you wanna know what's even better about this mysterious case and story about Calipari? is the fact that it's still currently going on. We haven't heard too much about scandals in the past five to 10 years he's been at Kentucky. Is that because he's not doing them anymore? Or is that because he's maybe getting away with them? Who knows? I don't wanna say it's ironic that Kentucky's always getting these four and five star recruits because everybody wants to play for him. But, you know, it's up for debate. I had a lot of fun making this video and doing a lot of research. It took a very long time to make it. So if you could leave a like, that would mean so much and drop your thoughts down below. But with all that being said, that's gonna wrap up this video. I hope you guys enjoyed the new little series we're starting. Hope you guys learned something if you're new to the channel. Appreciate it. if you hit that subscribe button, join the family and leave a like for more. And as always, let's be great. I'm out y'all, peace.